Chapter 23 Mayu Highlands, Hesperus II, Sky Province, Lyran Alliance, 1st of July, 3065 Brewer pushed his bulky neuro helmet into the compartment above and behind the command couch, feeling as though that action had depleted the last of his strength. He wiped perspiration from his forehead with a kerchief pulled out of his kit bag, but he might have spared himself the effort. The champion cockpit was so hot that new streams of sweat poured almost instantly as the cloth passed over the skin. That was one of the champion's few flaws. Compared to a PPC, its Lubalin LB-10X autocannon generated little waste heat for the amount of damage it inflicted nor did the missile launcher or the individual medium and small lasers produce that much thermal power. No, the problem was in the mech's heat sinks. The champion only carried 10 of the critical radiator-like devices, and those were the old standard model rather than the newer heat-efficient units. That meant that in any long-running battle, weapons fire and the increased demand for power on the mech's Vlar 300 power plant would result in an increased core temperature. Reaching for the handle of the ingress-egress hatch, he told himself that maybe when the thing was over, he could get the things replaced with the newer model. He smiled at the thought. After all, this was Hesperus. Maybe he should just take the champion up in the Defiance plant and have the tech boys simply swap them out. After all, what was the good in being a CEO if you didn't exercise a few prerogatives now and then? Brewer pulled the handle. A long, hissing pop accompanied the opening of the hatch, as the pressure inside and outside the cockpit equalized. Though toxic chemical weapons had been outlawed by the Ares conventions, such laws were not always observed, especially not during a civil war when old hatreds often overshadowed the brother-against-brother brother nonsense spouted by the media. Chemical agents had made a ghastly reappearance during Sun Tzu Liao's bid to thrust the Capellan Confederation to prominence. Thus it had become standard, although maybe reactionary, practice to pressure mech cockpits to 110% of a planet's normal atmosphere, where such a move was practicable. The technique kept even the most insidious chemical weapons outside the cockpit, where they would do the pilot no harm. As the hatch slid open, he took in the battle below. The fires that had been blazing in the ruins of the maglev train when he marched off to battle had been extinguished or had burned themselves out. Technicians, train crewmen and legion warriors moved like ants along the train, freeing those trapped by the wreckage and trying to salvage what gear they could. A large canopy made of several camouflage tarps had been strung up near the end of the train. A white flag bearing the ancient symbol of a red cross marked the tarps as an aid station. Brewer activated a control that should have dropped a chain ladder from the compartment beneath the hatch. When he didn't hear the familiar rattle of steel on steel, Brewer looked down to see that the compartment, along with the armor that surrounded it, had been blown away during the battle. Brewer leaned back inside the cockpit and picked up the communication headset. A tap of a control keyed in the mech's external speakers. Hey, anyone down there got a ladder? A man in civilian clothing looked up at the champion open hatchway. A ladder? Anything to get me down from here? Brewer repeated. Mine's been shot away. The man nodded and trotted off. In a moment he returned and flung a coil of heavy yellow nylon rope up to Brewer. The best I could find, he hollered. This'll do, thank you. The man waved and jogged away, while Brewer took some moments to find a suitable piece of equipment to which he might secure the rope. He knelt and looked into the gash in the armor where the ladder used to be. Fortunately one of the anchoring bolts and a few lengths of chain remained in the ruined compartment. Cautiously, as to not overbalance and end up making the eight-meter trip to the ground without the benefit of the rope, he tied the line to the ring bolt that had supported the ladder. He hoped he had made a good knot. He tugged hard on the rope several times to make certain. He leaned as far down as he could and dropped his kit back to the ground, tossing it back a bit so it would land under the mech, where it would not impede his landing and then, checking to make sure that no sharp metal edge was in contact with the line, he wriggled over the edge of the cockpit and started to climb down the rope. 
As his feet cleared the bottom of the champion outrust hull, his grip on the slippery nylon failed. The rope slipping through his hands peeled the skin from his palms. He did land on his feet, but stumbled in the loose rocky soil and fell forward, catching himself on the hands, causing even more damage. Feeling embarrassed by this clumsy display, he got back to his feet, looking around. Fortunately, everyone seemed to be occupied with other things. Wiping his abused palms on the fronts of his cooling vest, Brewer caught up his kit bag. Swiftly, he pulled on his cooling vest, donned a set of grey coveralls instead. He exchanged his boots for a couple of lightweight jogging shoes, and then stuffed his combat gear into the bag and set off towards the canopy. He'd only gone about a hundred meters when Davis McCall's Highlander pulled into the Grey Death's impromptu lager. Brewer stopped and waited while the Legion XX shut down his mech and also climbed down to the ground. That was a good piece of soldiering you did today, lad. McCall laid his hand on Brewer's shoulder. It'll go on your record. Thank you, Colonel, Brewer said, appreciating the rare compliment. He gestured to the wrecked train and the shot-up Legion mechs still straggling in from the battlefield. Do we have any idea of the butcher's bill? Not yet, lad. McCall shook his head sadly. Although I'm afraid it's gonna be high. He shook his head again and sighed deeply. No, let's go see the colonel. The colonel? Brewer exclaimed. Is she alive? Aye, lad, she is alive, McCall said with a haggard smile. Did you not know? She is alive, but she hurt her back. We then not ken how badly yet. They found her in the wreck out cold. The medic strapped her to a bit of siding with gaffer tape, not having a backward available. Doc Sweeney says she's in good shape, but that's all we know for now. Brewer felt some of his weariness lift at the news that Colonel Calmar Carlyle was alive. Grayson's death had been a major blow to the unit morale. He wasn't certain the Legion could survive losing her as well. He mastered a tired smile, and suggested that he and McCall go out and find how their commander was doing. The aid station was a nightmare scene, reminiscent of a long-gone age when men fought with muzzle-loading muskets, bayonets and swords, rather than battle mechs, lasers and particle cannons. Wounded men and women lay on the ground, covered by blankets and field jackets. Wounds had been roughly dressed, some using strips of cloth torn from the casualty's own clothing. Mercifully, most of the wounded were unconscious, either from shock or from medication. A short distance away, outside the tarps that sheltered the injured from Hesperus's blazing sun, lay a row of bodies shrouded in poncho liners. Brewer was surprised at a number of the huddled forms. Modern battles were far from bloodless, but powerful energy weapons and high-explosive warheads usually didn't leave much of a body to bury. The sight of the aid station, and the men and women who had been wounded in combat and injured by the train wreck, left Brewer feeling nauseous. McCall tapped him on the arm and pointed towards the back of the aid station. Brewer followed his gesture and spotted Lori sitting up against the side of a packing crate, her forehead and cheek masked by an expanse of self-adhesive bandage. What could be seen of her face was pale. She held a black-cased note pewter in her hands. As Brewer and McCall made their way to her, she caught sight of them and her face broke into a smile. I heard you both survived she said, her voice a bit thick from the painkillers. But they won't tell me anything else. What happened? How is the unit? The Legion is fine, lass, McCall said gently. It's you who's pointing south. Now, Davis, don't you start, she snapped, exhibiting sick bad temper. My back just went out on me, that's all. Doc Sweeney gave me some muscle relaxants and some painkillers. I'll be fine. Now, what happened out there? McCall and Brewer exchanged a glance, silently agreeing that McCall would speak. Well, Colonel, first thing off the mark, I want to put Captain Brewer up here for a commendation. He was the first to recover after the wreck. He got mounted up and threw up a screen to keep the Sassanac away from us while we pulled ourselves together. Is that true, Captain? Well, mostly true, Colonel. Brewer said. I just did what I thought was best. 
Then, when Colonel McCall relieved me, I went up to the main battle line as he ordered and helped direct the defense. They pushed us a couple of times, but we pushed back. That last time, I don't think we could have held them if it wasn't for Major Goree. Yes, I heard. Laurie tried to shove herself into a more upright position, wincing at the pain in her back. I came to about the same time the DSPF got into the fight. I wanted to mount up and go out to play with you boys, but they had me duct taped to this damn board, and the doc wouldn't let me loose. You're damn right I wouldn't, a tenor voice said behind them. Brewer recognized it as belonging to Dr. Greg Sweeney, the Legion regimental surgeon. You are in a train wreck, Colonel. Your back isn't broken or sprained or dislocated, and you can't thank blind dumb luck for that. But I didn't know that then, did I? If I'd sent you to battle with a cracked vertebrae or a dislocated disc or two, or ten, you might have ended up paralyzed. Or have you forgotten how rough a max right can be? No, Doctor, I haven't forgotten. How can I? You keep reminding me every fifty minutes or so. Laurie snapped. She turned back to the officers. You both did a good job out there today, especially you, Captain. And you made the right decision not to pursue the rangers back to their dropships. Maybe if the Lyran gods were here, or if we had at least the full legion, things might have been different. As it was, getting too close to the dropships would have been stupid, maybe even suicidal. And I suppose I owe Major Goree an apology. Y'all don't owe me anything, Colonel, Goree said coldly, stepping unexpectedly into the aid station. His face was still streaked with sweat from the heat of the cockpit, but his dark green coveralls were neat and clean. If I didn't join you when I did, the Separatists would have overrun your battle line, and probably the train as well. Then they would have turned right around and attacked Defiance again. It was a matter of military expediency. We were just doing our jobs. He looked squarely into Lori's eyes. Well, how are you, Colonel? I've been better, Major, she said. And I've been worse. I see. Goree's tone gave nothing away. Are you gonna be fit to lead your troops, or should I be talking to Mr. McCall? Give me a chance to x-ray her back and find out how bad she's hurt before you go shoving her back in the cockpit. Doc Sweeney said harshly. Laurie ignored him. I am still in operational command of the Legion. Colonel McCall and my battalion commanders will have tactical control, so you may address your questions to me. Very well, Colonel. I was just wondering what your plans are now. Goree's tone was as brusque as ever. Will you salvage your unit and return to Maria Zalaji, or do you intend to stay here in the Highlands? I've been thinking about that myself, Major, Laurie said. I don't think we can defend both Maria Zelogy and Defiance. The distance between them is too great. With the Maglev out of commission, it's just got a little greater. As important as the planetary capital and the spaceport are, the Defiance complex is the planet's primary asset. What I would like to do is recover what mechs I can from the battlefield and from the wreck, move the Legion into the complex, and use that as a base of operations. General Kiampa can either stay in Maria Zelogy or move out here with us. I assume, Major, that your mech facilities can handle another regiment or two. My facilities? No, but the overall complex can handle a full brigade and then some. Goree answered with a cold glance at Brewer. And I think the board will agree to let us use the facilities. Brewer caught the stress Goree placed on the word board. It seemed that for all Goree's help on the battlefield, the DSPF officer still hadn't much use for a CEO turned mercenary. He decided he was too tired to make an issue of Goree's prejudices, and let the matter pass with only an exasperated sigh for a comment. Good, Lori continued, ignoring the byplay between the officers. We're gonna use the Defiance plant as a base of operations for the area. If the rebels go anywhere, which I doubt, we're gonna figure something else out. Well, begging your pardon, Colonel, McCall interjected. I should need to remind you what happened to the German army during the Second World War on Terra, when they allowed themselves to get trapped in a factory complex. I know what happened at Stalingrad, Davis, 
but I got no intention of sitting back and waiting for the enemy to mass enough troops to grind us down, nor do I intend to wait for the rangers to launch their next attack. As soon as the legion is all in one place and we finish the repairs, I plan on going on the offensive. Chapter 24 Defiance Industries Complex Mayu Highlands, Hesperus II Sky Province, Lyran Alliance, 1st of July, 3065 over Dr. Sweeney's objection, Lori pulled herself to her feet. A sharp lance of pain shot through the muscles of her back, and the world sideslipped and took on a reddish hue. She lashed out with her left hand, grabbing McCall by the front of the jumpsuit. The bluff Caledonian stepped forward, catching her under the arms, which set off a new wave of dizzying pain. That's it, Colonel. I'm taking you off combat status, Sweeney barked. In that instant, Lori's vision cleared. She glared at the Legion's chief medic. No, doctor, you are not, she growled. I have far too much work to do. When this is over, if I'm still alive, you can take me off combat status. But until then, leave me alone. Colonel, if you're gonna go to fight, you're gonna end up paralyzed, maybe permanently. Understood. Colonel. That will be all, doctor, Lori blazed. Maybe you should listen to him, lass, McCall said mildly. We can a afford to lose ye. Leave me be, Davis. Laurie shrugged off his arm, gritting her teeth as agony ran along her spine. Colonel, I can summon a hover jeep to take you to the factory, Gori offered quietly. One of your men can pilot your victor for repairs once they get free of the wreck. I guarantee you'll be more comfortable in our hospital than you'll be here in the cold ground, waiting for them to cut your mech out of the rubble. Major Gori, Her voice trailed off like the hiss of an angry cat, but she felt her anger getting the better of her. She took a moment to get herself under control, but could still feel the anger burning deep inside her. She gazed around at a circle of officers, all of whom were looking worried. Major Gori, I appreciate your offer. I think I should accept it. Can you arrange for your technical people to come out here with some heavy equipment? Make recovery vehicles if possible, and help my technical crew with the recovery process? Of course, Colonel. Gori executed a short, formal bow and stepped out of the shelter tent to contact his base. And once we get back to Defiance, I'll need an office to work from. And I'll need a secure landline connection to the spaceport at Maria's Elegy, Lori said, thinking out aloud. After you've been checked out by their dogs, Sweeney told her firmly. For a second, her anger blazed again. She forced it down, locking it away in a secure corner of her mind. All right, doctor, I will wait until the deaf has pill pushers have the chance to poke and prod me. Sweeney nodded. Good enough, Colonel. Davis, you and Dan stay here and get the recovery operation going. Have Devin and Hawk move their troops over to the Defiance plant. One of Major Gorey's officers will direct them. The last was more of a question aimed at a DSPF commander, who had just returned to the aid station. Gorey nodded. Of course, and I also called for an ambulance for your wounded. We have a small but excellent hospital facility at the plant, any serious cases will be airlifted to Maria's elegy once they're more stable. Thank you, Major. We are indebted to you. Gori just smiled politely. One question, Major Gori, Brewer said sharply. Why this change in attitude? Before, you were almost ready to take on the Legion, regardless of the fact that I'm the company CEO and Duke of Asperus. Now you're the poster boy for helpful cooperation. That was before the Legion proved his intentions. Gori's tone was flat and unemotional. The difference is that now I know they can be counted on to fight in our corner. It's nothing more or less than that. It was several hours before Lori was given access to the office she asked for. In the meantime, the doctors gave her a good news that the back was neither broken nor sprained. The bad news was that she had a couple of cracked ribs, as well as bruises from the base of the skull to her hips. The doctors told her she would be very sore for a few days, but there was no lasting damage. She'd also been assigned an orderly, a slight young woman named Sarah Trotter, who Gurry promised was a top-flight assistant. 
I'm sorry, Colonel, but we can't get you a phone, Trotter was saying now. When the Separatists took out the maglev, they also knocked out the landline, because they were strung along the underside of the rail bed. We got techs out working the problem, but it may take several days to fix. Can you make do with wireless? I guess it'll have to do, Lori said, with a shrug so painful that she immediately made a mental note to avoid doing that again until her back healed. Trotter withdrew, saying she'd be just outside the office should Lori require anything. It took a minute or two for the call, which was essentially a long-range radio signal to be bounced between relay stations, before someone at the other end finally picked up. Lori directed the operator to connect her to the Legion compound. A moment later, Captain Joan Monty, her tank commander, was on the line. Joan, listen, Lori said, cutting off Monty's polite, concerned greeting. I need you to get the armored battalion and the rest of the infantry mounted up and moved out here. We're setting up shop at a defiance plant. We're gonna need every single legionnaire available. Right away, Colonel, Monty said. Does that mean what we heard about the maglev line getting out and you guys getting all shot is true? Partially. The maglev line is out, and some of the legion did get hurt, but for the most part we're in good shape. We fought one battle up here earlier today. If we're gonna continue operations, we're gonna need the rest of the outfit. Yes, ma'am. You want us to bring the dropships out there? No, Lori said loudly. Leave the ships on the tarmac. The Separatists have moved that captured warship in system. I'm afraid she'll shoot down any non-rebel aerospace craft she sees leaving the planet. You're gonna have to hump it over land. Okay, Colonel, Monty said in a strange tone, which Lori guessed was an overlay of apprehension at moving the balance of the Legion through the mountain passes. It might take a day or so, but we'll be on our way in a couple of hours. Good, Lori said, satisfied with the estimate. Transfer me back to the switchboard. I need to make some more calls. We'll be on our way as soon as possible, Colonel, General Kiampa told Lori. It may take a while, especially if you don't want us to use the dropships. Don't forget that not using them also makes it impossible to recall Zambos' guards from Maldon. I know that, General, but I don't think we should risk using the ships until we figure out just how aggressive the rebels are planning to be with that warship. They already disabled and captured our own jump ships. I'd rather not risk losing the dropships and their crews, too, and that goes for your Lyran troops as well. No, we don't want to risk that, Kiampa said. But it'll take a couple of days for us to get the whole regimental combat team moving out to defiance, but we'll make the move as fast as we can. One more thing, General, Lori said before breaking the connection. If you haven't made that call we discussed, now would be the time to do it. Lori knew that most units the size of those she was facing boasted sophisticated electronic surveillance equipment. It would be easy for the rebels to intercept the conversations she just had and act upon them. But short of sending one of the civilian VTOLs belonging to Defiance Asperus back to Maria's elegy with written instructions, she had little other choice. Trusting the chopper to deliver the messages would be just as risky. The Sky Rangers had already proved that they were willing to fire upon civilian targets, even ones as vital as the maglev train. If they detected, intercepted, and destroyed the VTOL, not only would she lose the message, but she would lose the aircraft and the crew. There was also the chance that the VTOL would be forced to land, resulting in the message falling in the hands of the enemy. As much as she hated the idea of sending a call for reinforcement over an unsecured communication link, she didn't see any other choice. Have you got all that? Gina Kiampa asked, having personally gone to the small business office attached to the Comstar HPG station, located at the northern end of Maria's Elegy spaceport. Yes, General, the Comstar technician replied. Priority 1 HPG message to Sky, addressed to Hauptmann General Rainer Pullin. Message reads, Hesperus II under heavy attack by 4th and 22nd Sky Rangers. Request immediate reinforcements. Signed, Gina Kiampa, Lieutenant General, 15th Lyran Guards. Message ends. Is that correct? That is correct, Adept, Kiampa said, turning to leave. Please make certain it goes out pronto. A call for William von Frisch came in from the captain who'd been given the captured Lyran warship. 
General, this is Captain Kerlenko, she said. We just picked up an electronic signal coming from the spaceport at Maria's Elegy. The general looked up at a map a technician had called on the van's primary view screen. The graphic representation of the area of space around Hesperus II showed a small golden blip where the Simon Davian was in geosynchronous orbit above the planetary capital. Fitted with the most advanced electronics available to the Federated Suns, the ultra-modern Avalon-class cruiser was easily able to detect groundbound electronic emissions from space. Any idea what they are? he demanded. Oh, we got a good idea what they are, Kerlenko said. It's an HPG carrier signal. It looks as though someone on the ground is getting ready to send out an HPG message. It's that bitch Carlyle, von Frisch spat. Or Kiampa, or Zambos. They're trying to call for help. Can you shut it down, Captain? Not from here, sir. Maybe a commando team might, but we don't have any commandos. The best we have is a couple of dozen marines. But even if we send them on the surface, they would never arrive in time. Then destroy the source, von Frisch said arrogantly. General, that's a Comstar facility down there. That it is, Captain, von Frisch spat back. And that Comstar facility is about to call in reinforcements. I'd bet my life on it. And if that's what they're doing, then they're no longer neutral, but are taking sides in the war. Destroy it. We'll settle with Comstar later, after the Isle of Sky is free. But, General... That's an order, Captain. Yes, sir. Captain Elena Kerlenko stepped away from the communication console and looked across the Simon Davion Bridge. In one corner of her mind, she told herself she'd really have to rename the vessel. Maybe that honor would go to her crew. If so, she thought it would be a wonderful gesture to name her the Bartlett, after Private Roy Bartlett, the first of the Marines to board a cruiser during the capture, and the first one to lose his life in the process. Helmsman, begin a spiral descent, take us down to 300 kilometers, and park us right over the spaceport. Oi, Captain. As the ship nosed down into a long, slow, spiraling dive towards the planet, Kerlenko spent the time studying the maps and radar images of Maria Zelegy spaceport, stored in the Simon Davian's computer banks. She wanted to make certain the fire control systems could positively identify the Comstar HPG facility before she ordered the gunners to open fire. The Comstar facility was technically a neutral site. As the organization's military also formed the heart of the Starlink Defense Force, it had taken no official stance in the matter of the Sky Rebellion. That was bad enough, though Kerlenko understood the necessity of stopping any military communication from leaving Hesperus II. She also knew the terrible risk of bringing the ship's guns to bear on a relatively tiny ground target. If the gunner calculations were off by even a couple of degrees, the deadly barrage could hit a civilian area of the city. She decided that she would call von Frisch and tell him the target could not be clearly identified if there was even a chance of that happening. Let him clean his own mess. For a few moments, she even considered disobeying the order, but quickly realized that he was right. If Sky was ever to throw the yoke of Steiner domination, there were risks that would have to be taken. In that instant, she made the fateful decision to carry out William von Frisch's orders. A few minutes later, the helmsman called out that they were in position. Helmsman, give me a slow roll to starboard, 90 degrees. She peered closely at the chart depicting the spaceport. Gunnery officer, bring your starboard anti-ship weapons to bear on grid Whiskey Romeo 9071 by Alpha Lima 306 and fire one broadside. Gina Chiampa was walking across the spaceport tarmac with her aide, Colonel Nana Brennan, when the chief warrant officer in charge of the spaceport sensor and communication station called on her portable comm unit. General Kiampa, this is Chief Sellars. The Simon has settled into a new orbit. It looks like a geosync, about 300 kilometers up. Sellars had been feeding her reports about the warship's movements for the last ten minutes. Hold on a minute. Holy Mary, Mother of God, we're picking up fire control signals. I think they're about to start. A clap of thunder ended Sellars' message. 
followed by an incandescent beam of light shooting through the darkening sky. The laser bolt flashed from sky to earth in the northeast corner of the spaceport. Before Kiampa's stunned mind could begin to understand what had happened, a second beam snapped into existence with eye-hurting intensity. A second thunderclap shook the air, followed by a hollow boom. A ball of flame boiled into the air at the far end of the port, followed by a series of laser blasts slashing into the ground. What were they shooting at? Realization dawned in an instant. The HPG station. Kiampa was sure no one could have survived the attack. The urgent request for reinforcements would not be sent. General, the cruiser has altered the course. She is now heading 285 True, Sellar said tensely. That will bring them right over the spaceport, and we're still picking up fire control sensors. Before Kiampa could react, a laser blast tore into the empty building that, until recently, had been the primary barracks facility for the Great Death Legion. The structure was blown apart and then set ablaze by the laser's fiery touch. Another blast gouged a strip out of the tarmac, leaving thick, oily smoke and dark, greasy flame in its wake. Not one more second passed before Kiampa threw herself to the pavement and rolled under a ground jeep as an ear-splitting crack sounded. Half a second later, an Atlas assault mech crumpled in on itself as the blast of a naval gauss rifle swatted it to the ground. More savage blasts followed, the ground shaking from the incredible energy being unleashed at the spaceport. A laser bolt smacked into the tarmac 20 meters away from Kiampa's hiding place, sending ash and burning tar pavement showering down on her. Three Grey Death Legion fighters died in a fireball created by the naval autogannon shells. What the hell is going on? Brennan yelled over the cacophony of exploding ordnance and massive energy discharges. A hunk of misshapen metal clanged off the hood of the jeep. Debris skittered across the hood, landing on the pavement not far from Kiampa's face. In one of those odd moments of clarity that sometimes occurred in combat, Kiampa realized that the piece had once been an ammunition cassette for an autocannon. Naval bombardment, she screamed back. Those bloody bastards are bombarding us. No sooner had the words left her lips than the attack lifted. For a long moment, Kiampa stayed where she was. Across the spaceport, an ammunition bunker had been struck, blanketing the base with both exploding and unexploded ordnance. Smoke from a burning fuel tank hung low in the sky, blotting out the sunset. Over the noise of the fires and detonating ordnance, she could hear the screams of the wounded and the dying and the high, thin ululation of a siren. Slowly, she got up to her feet and then stood staring empty-eyed across the devastated spaceport. The battle for Hesperus had taken a new and ugly turn.